Welcome to Fix It Home Improvement, covering projects that every homeowner should know and great products for home and garden. Hi, I'm JC, and this is where we share weekly home improvement tips. I'm here with my co-host, Cindy. Hello, Jason. Hi, Cindy. This week, we're going to talk about bath and shower tile, and we'd like to thank Elmara for liking and sharing the podcast. And in December, you'll be able to find our podcast on Pandora. They're going to start carrying podcasts now, and we were picked to be part of the launch. Exciting. And I spoke to Joe Truini to get some updated information, and he wrote the book, Stanley Tiling a homeowner's guide and this is a great reference book if you plan on doing a bunch of tiling projects around the house it has a lot of pictures good instruction it has floor and wall tile techniques and we spoke to joe before when he talked about sheds right he's written like eight different books he's also written articles for this old house popular mechanics and fine home building and then he has the website diytoolsandtips.com mm-hmm. and if you're looking for his books his name is spelled T-R-U-I-N-I. Nice. The ancient Egyptians used tile in their tombs and temples. The ancient Romans, they used tile embedded in mortar in their public baths. And some historians think that the first ceramic tile was developed in Egypt around 1000 BC. Hmm. And ceramic comes from the Greek word meaning pottery or burnt stuff. (laughs) That's great. You stuff in the definition. (laughs) Henry M. Rothberg was a chemical engineer and he developed the first thin set mortar in 1956. He bought the Latacrete Company, and they still make top rated mortar for tile and stone. If you plan on replacing a tile for your tub or shower, this is a great time to update the shower and tub faucets, shower arm, and shower head. You can add grab bars and accessories. And when I spoke to Joe, he mentioned if you have a tub now with a shower head, Think about removing the tub and replacing it with a low-curb shower base if you don't take baths regularly. This is going to give you a more modern look, and if you're remodeling a bathroom for an older relative, it's much easier to get in and out of a shower rather than stepping up and into a tub. Right. And if you plan on taking out an old tub and it's cast iron, breaking it up with a sledgehammer is going to make it much easier to remove. Hmm. Are there more steps to this than just hitting it with a sledgehammer? (laughs) I would remove the cover plate first on the tub. Turn the water off, too, before you start whipping a sledgehammer around in the tub. And then remove the flange from your yeah, drain. You put on a pair of goggles. Yeah, goggles, hearing protection. I would wear a Why dust... Why you need hearing protection? Anything over 85 decibels. You should this be... going to be loud? Oh, yeah, man. It's using a sledgehammer on this. Cause... I don't know. I've never done that. <laughs> yes, wear hearing protection. <laughs> and then I would start from the outside. I'd throw a blanket or a drop cloth over the outside edge of it. I don't think you finished a sentence yet. <laughs> well, I do speak for a living. <laughs> and start using the sledgehammer on the outside, hitting the bottom of the center of the tub, and work your way up. It's going to start breaking off porcelain, and then it'll start to crack the tub as you work up the side. Hit the top on the outside edge of the tub, and then work your way down on the inside, and you're going to start breaking off chunks of the tub. Then you can work your way across the bottom in the center and go up the inside wall on the opposite side, and you can pretty quickly break this. I mean, it's it's definitely work, but you're going to be able to break this into two large sections. So not and, quickly? And <laughs> it's going to be moderately quick. <laughs> and then if, if you can, you can pull it out in a couple of big sections, or you can just keep working on it, and you can break it into fairly small pieces. And it's a lot easier because these tubs can be very heavy, hundreds of pounds, and you know, trying to get it down a hallway and out of a house. It's going to be much easier if you break it up. Okay. Should you wear a dust mask? I didn't say dust mask. No, you said hearing protection. Yeah, yeah. wear goggles and a dust mask. And I would wear a two-strap N95, and 3M makes most of the top rated. Although Soft Seal, they have an N95 dust mask with dual straps, and they have a silicone seal all around the outside edge for a better fit, and that's NIOSH approved. And that's the National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health. To remove the old tile and the tile backer board, if you've taken out the tub or a shower base and you're replacing that, you can grab underneath a section where it's exposed and pull at it and see whether you can break off a section. Or you can remove a section of tile with a pull and pry bar and a hammer, take a hammer and pound through whatever that backer board is, and then try to grab a section and pull it off. If it was held in place with galvanized nails, 
it's pretty easy to pull off a section at a time. If it's screwed in place, then you're going to have to take off the tiles, use a drill, and remove the screws. And it can be pretty heavy if they use cement board. A three foot by five foot section can weigh anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds, depending yeah. on the manufacturer. And make sure you're wearing good quality gloves, goggles, and a dust mask. Okay. Joe had a tip for cutting out old sections of tile and wall board using a reciprocating saw. So he said take an old blade and squeeze the trigger till the blade is fully extended and then make a mark about an inch from the saw's shoe plate and then take the blade out and put it into a vise at that line, bend it back and forth until it snaps, and then put that short piece of the blade back into your reciprocating saw and then cut into the grout lines and cut out sections. So either two foot by two foot or two foot by three foot, and then pry out those sections with a pull and pry bar. And that way you don't have to worry about cutting into either water lines or electric. Hmm. If you have plaster walls with tile, you can score the plaster just beyond the tile with a razor knife and then use a small handheld sledge, or you can use a short length of two by four, hold it against the wall and hit it with a hammer or a sledge and you'll start to break apart the plaster, you'll loosen the tile, once you get down to the lath, use a reciprocating saw and cut down through the wood pieces. Then use a pull and pry bar and remove the lath. You just need to be careful about pipes or wires behind the wall using probably a short length of blade like Joe suggests would probably be a good idea. Mm -hmm. And make sure you're wearing goggles and a dust mask. So you need to get down to the studs, right? Right, because we want to put up water-resistant or waterproof tile backer board to put our new tiles over. So this has changed over the years. Yeah, they used to put up green board or just water-resistant drywall, and they found out that it, you know, the grout lines, they slowly absorb water over a period of years or they get cracks in it. Water goes through, and especially down low, like a lot of these investment properties I bought, I would go in in the bathrooms down low in the shower or the tub. It would just be mush, mm -hmm. and we'd have to remove it. And put. And it, it, when I first started investing in real estate, we are still putting up green board. But you're old. <laughs> but now that's no longer code inside a shower or a tub, which cement backer board is. And then you're going to cover all the seams with a fiberglass mesh tape. You're going to cover that with thin set mortar and you're going to seal the seams. But because cement backer board still isn't totally waterproof, what some pros will do is they'll staple plastic sheets to the studs before they put up the cement boards. Hmm. And that'll help protect the studs in case water works through the grout lines. Some pros will skim coat the entire surface of the backer board with thin set when they're sealing the seams. Mm. So you're going to get better waterproofing and better adhesion for the tiles. And Joe recommends using a waterproof liquid membrane. So after you seal your seams, you paint two coats of this waterproofing on cement backer board. And that's going to waterproof it. Some top-rated liquid waterproof membranes are from MAPE, it's M-A-P-E-I, and it's called their Aqua Defense. Redguard, it's R-E-D-G-A-R-D, and that's from Custom Building Products. And Laticrete, it's L-A-T-I-C-R-E-T-E, -E. they have something called Hydroban, H-Y-D-R-O, capital B-A-N. And then there's a product called Curdy Membrane. It's K-E-R-D-I. So if you don't want to roll on a liquid waterproofing, this comes in rolls. You put a thin coat of thin set on your cement board, and then you embed these sheets into it, and it creates a waterproof membrane. Hmm. They also have a product called Curdy Board that's an alternative to cement board, and it comes in half inch by 48 by 38 inch sheets. And this attaches directly to the studs around your tub or your shower, it's held in place with screws and washers. Then the seams and the screws are sealed with their seam tape and thin set mortar. And these boards are very lightweight, only around two pounds. And Did you say cement board was? Cement board anywhere from 40 to 60 pounds. Okay, so that's Dep a big difference. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, huge. And it cuts with a razor knife. So very easy where cement board is, is much more difficult to cut and put holes in. There's also a product called Den Shield Tile Backer. It's D E N S, capital S H I E L D. And this comes in half inch by four foot by eight foot sheets. So this feels a lot like regular drywall. It's highly water resistant and it's rated for around tubs and showers to use with tile. It can be used in wet areas. It doesn't need a waterproof barrier. And this scores and breaks like regular drywall, but it's lighter and easier to cut through than cement board. And then you're going to seal your seams and screws with fiberglass tape and thin set. 
So a four foot by eight foot sheet of this weighs around 64 pounds. Hmm where, like you say, cement board's 40 to 60 for a 3 by 5 sheet. Right. And regular drywall, half inch, 4 by 8 sheets, will run anywhere from 50 to 60 pounds, depending on the manufacturer. Hmm. There's a product called Go Board Tile Backer Board, and it's G-O-B-O-A-R-D. And this comes in half inch by 3 foot by 5 foot sheets. It's waterproof and lightweight, only 7.5 pounds a sheet. And this you can cut with a utility knife. And they have their own sealant to cover the seams and their screw heads. So it's kind of a system with their backer boards. Okay. So there's some options to cement board. I would take a look at my local home center and see what type of products they carry for tile backer boards. And then read the installation instructions because you need to know what type of fasteners you're going to have to pick up. And what steps are required to seal the seams, the screws, the shower arm, the spout, and then the shower or tub controls. Okay. Before you put up your tile backer boards, make sure the stud spacing is good for your product, and then plan ahead if you want to put in grab bars or accessories. You can add 2 by 4 blocking between the studs to anchor your accessories, and I would make notes or take pictures with the measurements so you can screw directly into that blocking between the tiles through the grout lines if possible. Use a bit specifically for tile or glass if you have to create a hole through tile, and then use a masonry bit for the grout lines. There's a lot of different options when you're shopping for grab bars and accessories. Yeah, the spacing of it, how wide they are, where they'd fit on the studs, the angles, and then the flange itself where you're going to put your screws through. Some of them spin, so that way you can line it up to the grout lines easier. So right. yeah, I would definitely compare when yeah. I was shopping. To get some ideas, you should take a look at some of the shower niches and alcoves online. What do you mean, niches? So little small recessed areas where you can put like your shampoo bottle. Oh. So if you're putting in blocking for grab... So like shelves. Yeah, yeah. You can create little recessed areas to store your stuff and then just tile it. Mm -hmm. So you want to think through your tile size and your layout. But if you plan on using large tile and then running an accent strip across the back wall with mosaic tile, for example, mm -hmm. you could put that mosaic tile inside a recessed niche or you could use that strip and then create little niches that use the same tile like an accent. So there's some pretty cool designs online. And you know, mosaic tile goes back to ancient Greece. They use small colored stones to decorate walls and floors. Thank you for that information. <laughs> <laughs> I have like a soundtrack in the back of my mind. Like when I say some of these cool trivia things that you're just applauding. and Does that ever happen? <laughs> and confetti goes off. <laughs> so, you know, at the home centers, the most popular tile sizes for shower and tubs are 12 by 12, 12 by 24, 6 by 24, 6 by 6, 13 by 13, 18 by 18, and subway styles, 3 inches by 6 inches, and 3 by 12. You know, subway style tiles were created in 1904 for the New York subway? Yes. <laughs> So tiles 12 inches by 12 inches or larger will install faster. You're going to have fewer grout lines. And Joe recommends using large tiles 10 by 13 or larger from the bottom of the wall up to about 6 feet high and then add a strip of mosaic tile or chair rail tile and then use smaller tile either 2 by 2 or 6 by 6 up to the ceiling. And he said that gives a very professional look. Good to know. The most common types of tile for baths and showers are ceramic, which is going to be the most affordable. You have porcelain, glass, and natural stone. And when I spoke to Joe, he mentioned natural stone is porous, it stains easily, and it can be difficult to clean. And he's saying most natural stone is going to require two coats of a professional grade sealer. Mm -hmm. So he's saying look at ceramic and porcelain tile that have the look of stone. It's going to be less expensive and much easier to maintain. Right. And when you're purchasing your tile, look at the lot numbers on the boxes. You want to match all the boxes, and that way the color and the patterns are going to match better. And when you're putting up the tile, you want to intermix the tiles from the boxes because of color variations. And you then make sure you keep your receipts. Absolutely. Yeah, because especially ceramic, you can have nicks and imperfections on ceramic, and, and so you're probably going to end up returning quite a few. So keep your receipt and some boxes. Mm -hmm. Once you pick your tile, you should find out the recommended space for your grout lines, and you can either use tile spacers or there's leveling systems to keep the tile edges flush. 
Uh-huh. And some of these systems can be used with spacers, and some of these leveling systems will space the tile for you. And there's a strap or a spacer that you're sliding under the tile, usually two per side, and then there's a strap or a rod that you're connecting a wedge or a cap to. Then you're using a tool like a pliers, and you're tightening down this wedge or this cap, and it's going to force the tile so that the edges are completely aligned. And you should check the tile size recommended for each one of these systems. Because it can be on level, right? Depending on the amount of mortar and stuff you're putting on each one. Exactly, and how how much force you're putting on it as you're putting the tile in. So there can be a little bit of a variance where the edges this seems are... like a lot of work. And <laughs> we get done with it and it's uneven. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, man, you're angry. <laughs> Yeah, so the systems are pretty cool. And some top-rated leveling systems are from Ramondi. It's R-A-I-M-O-N-D-I, Q-E-P, and it's just the letters Q, E, and P. Ruby, R-U-B-I. There's a system called Perfect Level Master. There's also a system called Spin Doctor, Hmm. and I just like the name. (laughs) Did we mention that you have to knock these things off after the mortar drive? <laughs> right. Yeah, so you can take a rubber mallet and whack them, and they snap off. So they're pretty easy to remove, and it's fun. <laughs> and then once you have all your tiles and you know your spacing, you want to lay them out side to side and top to bottom because you don't want to end up going from left to right, let's say, and have a very narrow strip in a corner. You want to shift your layout so you have equally sized cut pieces at each end, and then you're going to have your full pieces in your main field. And then from top to bottom, you'd probably want a full piece on the top working down to the very bottom row. And that bottom row should be about half the size of a full tile. If not, then you can shift it accordingly, and then you'll have cut pieces at the top and the bottom. But a full piece looks good at the top. Also take a look at bullnose tile for the end walls or what trim pieces are available to finish any exposed edges of the tile. Hmm. And then are you going to be using a shower door or shower curtains? Where do you want those tiles to end? You should also take a look online at all the different patterns you can create when you're laying out your tile. I'm surprised how many ways you can actually stagger tile or use a couple different size tiles to create interesting designs. Mm -hmm. And they have some pretty cool names like herringbone, hopscotch, running bond, or on point. (laughs) That's definitely how you should pick your tiles, is by its name. (laughs) You usually don't want to start laying your first row of tiles on the tub or the shower base. You need that first row to be perfectly level. So many pros are recommending using a ledger board on all three sides of your walls, just above that bottom row. So So what is this? So this is a very level piece of wood. So either a 1x2 or a 1x4. And especially if that first row, that bottom row, are going to be cut pieces, generally you're going to put all your full pieces up first. So you can create a mark where that first row of full pieces would be. Put your ledger board under that, and now you can rest your full pieces on this and start from the bottom up. And this way, especially if if you're not putting in those cut pieces first, they're not going to sag. Like the whole wall sags? <laughs> right, which would be a real drag. <laughs> you also want to figure out where your tile are going to line up so those end pieces are going to be even in size. So when you put your first tile, your first full piece on your ledger board, you're going to now create a plumb line with a level so that you've got this vertical line all the way up the wall, and it's going to give you another line to follow. For most projects, you're going to be mixing thin set mortar to hold your tiles in place unless the tile backer board or the shower system has their own unique adhesive. Uh And you also have to see what the tile manufacturer recommends. Porcelain and glass tile absorb moisture different than ceramic or stone. Also, it matters the tile size. Really? There are two main types of thin set mortar, modified and unmodified. And unmodified is usually Portland cement, sand, water, and moisture holding chemicals. The modified mortar adds latex and other chemicals to make it more glue like. It increases the strength and water retention. But you need to check the installation recommendations. Curdy Board, for example, wants you to use only unmodified thin set. Hmm. So some top rated thin set is from Laticrete. MAPE, TEC, Custom Building Products, and Schluter. And that's S-C-H-L-U-T-E-R. And there's gray or white if you have translucent or glass tile. Mm -hmm. You'd want to use white. 
If it if you can't see through the tile, then you just use gray. Okay. You can mix dry, thin-set mortar in a five-gallon bucket, then add water and mix it with a mixing paddle and a drill. A half-inch drill is going to have more power for mixing. You're going to spread the mortar on the wall with the smooth side of a trowel first, and then use the notch side, and you're going to pick a notch trowel based on the size and the recommendation for your tile. Okay. So, for example, a 4x4 four four tile, generally you're going to use a 3 16 notch trowel, 8 inch by 8 quarter inch notch trowel, 12 inch by 12 inch, 3 eighths, 16 by 16 or bigger half inch notch, but check the installation instructions. Only mix as much mortar as you can use in about 10 minutes and then clean out the bucket and mix a new batch and keep your tools clean between applications. And when you're putting your tiles into the mortar on the wall, many pros recommend back buttering each tile for better adhesion. What is that? So this is putting a thin layer of mortar on the back of the tile with a smooth edge of the trowel. Mm -hmm. Especially if you have tiles with indentations in the back or large tiles or all natural stone tile, they recommend that you back butter each tile. How long do you have to wait before you can grout? Usually 24 to 48 hours. Once you get your tiles up, I would check the label and then clean the label out on what? the label on your mortar. And then clean out the grout lines of any excess mortar before it hardens. Okay. You're also going to need some tools, so you'll need a tile cutter, maybe a wet saw. You're going to need drill bits to cut out holes and notches, and many of these tools you can rent. Good. Do you have anything else to add? If you're looking for a great reference book for tile projects, check out Joseph Truini's Stanley Tiling, A Homeowner's Guide. And check out some options for tile backer board at your local home centers. They're pretty interesting, some of these new products. I would research the recommended thin set for your tile backer board and the tile. And then look at some of these new large tiles. They're pretty cool. <laughs> Let's wrap this up. You can subscribe to our podcast soon on Pandora, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, CastBox, and Player FM, or your favorite podcast app. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a review. You can check out our home improvement videos on our YouTube channel, Fix It Home Improvement. And you can subscribe to that as well. You can download our books, Home Improvement Solutions, What Every Homeowner Should Know, Book 1 through 5. We are almost ready to send Book 6 to the editor. If you enjoyed it, please leave us a 5-star rating and review. You can email us at fixitpodcast at gmail.com, and you can follow Cindy on Twitter at fixitcohost. Thank you for listening. Talk to you next week. Deep, 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 de